Well, now we begin one of my favorite phyla. It's Phylum platyhelminthes. And the reason it's my favorite is because it deals with a lot of parasitic type worms. And typically, my class, when we discuss these guys, um, get very squirmy. They don't like learning about these gross, disgusting worms, but um, they're actually quite interesting. So if we look at our evolutionary tree or our cladogram, these guys are a little bit more advanced than periphera and cnidaria. They now have, so they have bilateral symmetry. They have something called spiral cleavage. It has to do with the way that their um, zygotes divide. Um, but they don't have a complete gut yet, as you can see um, some of the other organisms do. They can actually just absorb nutrients right through their epidermis. So here are some characteristics of phylum platyhelminthes. The picture on the right is a picture of a planarian, and you'll actually be doing a lab on these guys. This is one of the non-parasitic worms in this phylum. So Phylum platyhelminthes, their common name is flatworms. They all have bilateral symmetry, meaning they do have a head end, so you can divide them in half down uh, one way. They have cephalization, what, in meaning what I just said, that they have a head area with a concentration of sense organs. The most common flatworm are planarians, and where I get them from, I just get them from my pond. They happen to be carnivorous, so I can, um, usually what I do is I hang some cooked egg in a gauze um, pocket, basically, out in the water, and I do it overnight, and the next morning they're kind of in there attached, and then I'll bring them in. So this phylum contains over 34,000 species of flatworms. The adults in this uh, phylum can range from one millimeter in length to uh, 25 meters long. That's twice the length of my classroom. That's big. They can live in marine, freshwater, and damp terrestrial habitats. Uh, they are acelomates, meaning they do not have a true coelom. They do have an ectoderm. They just have kind of a fluid-filled mesoderm and an endoderm area. The mesoderm tissue includes a loose tissue. It's called parenchyma that fills spaces between specialized tissues, organs, and a body wall. This area may provide skeletal support, nutrient storage, motility, trans it helps to transport materials, stores oxygen, that sort of thing. Flatworms will feed in a couple different ways. Uh, some of them can be carnivores or scavengers, and others are parasites. So here's the two basic categories, the free-living ones and the parasitic. Free-living example is the planaria and parasitic would be the flukes and the tapeworms. This, that's a tapeworm there, and that's a fluke. So let's go over some of their body systems. They do have a very rudimentary nervous system, so this is a little more complex than a jellyfish. They have lateral nerve cords. Remember, lateral means to the side, and they have cerebral ganglion, so they have this nerve bundle in their head area that kind of serves as their information center. They don't have true eyes, but they do have these little spots that are called eye spots, and they're sensitive to light. They're called, they're considered photosensitive. And then they have oracles that also help them sense their surroundings. So they have a nervous system with a distinct head and simple brain. They have long nerve cords that run down the length of their body, and then short little nerve cords that run across their body. They do have an excretory system so that they can get rid of um, ammonia wastes. They live in fresh water. They do have, what they have, they don't have kidneys, so they have something called flame cells, and they help remove excess water from their bodies. They do have just one opening for their digestive system. 
Most cells are close to the external environment, therefore materials can pass easily into and out of their bodies via diffusion. They rely on diffusion for respiration, excretion, and circulation. And the other functions uh, vary among the species, whether they're free living or parasitic. So our first class are the free living ones. This is class Turbillaria. They are mostly the free living bottom dwellers in freshwater and marine environments. Some of them are pretty ornate and um, kind of neat looking. They will crawl on stones, sand, vegetation, and they're named for the turbulence that their beating cilia create in the water. So that's where this class name came from. And here's a couple of these platyhelminthes. There's over 3,000 species of turbularians. There are a few terrestrial species. They live in very humid uh, tropical areas. They can range from one centimeter long and up to 60 centimeters long. They're the first group of bilaterally symmetrical animals to appear. And their most commonly studied member is from the genus Dugesia, and that's the freshwater planarian, and you'll be studying them. Here's a general planarian anatomy. You should become familiar with it because you will be identifying it when we um, take a look at our planarians from the pond. So you'll be able to see their eye spots and you'll be able to see their oracle. They have a pharynx. So basically this is their, their mouth that goes to their stomach area. Um, and it's right in the middle of their body. It's not at their head area. And they do kind of have a gastrovascular cavity. It's not a regular stomach. They will have um, areas for both ovary development and um, like a, a sperm development or little testes. You probably will not be able to identify that in the planaria that we'll be looking at. Um, we're really just looking at the external anatomy when we look at them. Um, the way that they feed, they are carnivores. They'll eat small invertebrates. They can scavenge on dead things. Some of them can be herbivorous and eat algae. They have sensory cells in their heads. They're called chemoreceptors. If you look up the prefix chemo, it just means chemical. Um, so they're going to help look for food. And they have a digestive cavity that has a single opening, so food goes in and waste can come out that area. Uh, they have a pharynx. This is a little muscular extension out of their body. And it helps to pump food into their digestive cavity. They have a very highly branched gut that helps transport their nutrients throughout their body, and then they can use diffusion to get those nutrients to their cells. The parasitic, like tapeworms, do not have a branched gut area. Locomotion, how do they move? They have cilia on their epidermal cells that help them glide through the water and over the bottom of streams or ponds. A layer of mucus is usually laid down to help them um, adhere to things and gives them traction. So here's just kind of an image of how they would move. Their muscles, um, they kind of have muscular cells controlled by the nervous system, and it, it allows them to twist and turn so they can react to stimuli. They have a dorsoventral muscle that's essential for helping them maintain flatness. And here's where all of those directional terms are starting to show up dorsoventral, so um, these are muscles that run from their back to their belly that help make them flat so that they can easily diffuse things into their bodies. Here you can see the dorsoventral muscle um, highlighted for you in a cross section on their transverse plane. So exchanging uh, items or things with the environment. They don't have respiratory organs, so the respiration occurs uh, through diffusion. 
they have to exchange CO2 and O2. They also have to exchange um, waste, they have to get rid of these ammonia byproducts. And for circulation, they don't have a circulatory system. So all of the nutrients and gases and things need to be circulated basically through diffusion. For excretion, we kind of mentioned this already, they have little things called flame cells. In these guys, they have uh, a network called protonephridia, and these are like little tubules of excretion, so they can get rid of that ammonia waste. And then their flame cells are kind of more within, and they help induce currents to push the fluid through these little tubules. The tubules will eventually merge, open to the outside of the body, and um, the wastes go through a minute opening called a nephridiopore. Nervous system in these planaria, they have something called a mechanoreceptor. They can sense pressure at their anterior end, so at their head end, and it detects their body position. It can feel gravity in this part. They have cerebral ganglia. Um, again, we've talked about that before. Kind of gives them a little brain area. They do have longitudinal nerve cords, and this gives them, if you were to look at their nervous system, it looks kind of like a ladder through their body. And this is one of those evolutionary advancements in nervous systems. The oracles are sensory lobes on the sides of their head to help them find food. They have the chemoreceptors there. Their eye spots are, the other sciencey word for them are ocelli. In the picture, their singular term is ocellus. And they have photoreceptors to see, to help them see. But they don't really see like we do, they just kind of sense light and dark. So their way of reproducing, they can reproduce asexually and they can reproduce sexually. Their asexual reproduction, they can do it through budding or fission. So they can like grow another little baby off the side of them. Or these are the kind of worm you, you can cut them in half and eventually they'll grow another part that you cut off and um, they'll work just fine. And we're actually going to try that with the planaria. Um, in the past, the students haven't been able to keep them alive long enough to watch them grow a new head or a new tail, but maybe we'll try. Um, so they do have regeneration abilities. Sexual reproduction, um, each planaria will donate and then receive sperm from a different planarian. So uh, what are the benefits to sexual reproduction over asexual reproduction? And it's the same as it is for any organism. Um, they're going to get more variety in offspring. They do have both testes and ovaries, so they are considered hermaphrodites. Their eggs develop inside their body and are shed in capsules called cocoons. L several weeks later, the eggs hatch and will grow into adults. Quick review of the turbellarians. So what type of symmetry do they have? How do they eat? And what type of sensory organs do they have? How do they reproduce? So these are things for you to remember and go back over if you don't remember them. All right, parasitic flatworms. This is the, the fun section. There's a few different classes here. They, we have class monogenea, class trematoda, and class cystodia. So monogenes, they are small parasitic flatworms. The body is usually flat and oval, and they're usually just about two centimeters, not any bigger than that. Most monogeneans are ectoparasites, so they live on the outside of fish and other aquatic animals, um, although there are a few that live in urinary bladders of turtles and frogs, so they kind of get into their urinary system. Here's a diagram of 
the four common families of monogenians, not drawn to scale, but different body structures that you can see here. The way they reproduce, they have a specific life cycle. It does involve a host because they are parasites. The eggs hatch into ciliated larvae, which may attach directly to a host or swim freely for a time until they find a host. The adults lack these cilia. Like other flatworms, monogenians have no coelom. They do have a simple digestive system that has a mouth opening with a muscular pharynx, part, like a partial intestine, but no anus. Monogenians have a collection of various attachment structures. The anterior structures are collectively termed the prohaptor, and the posterior ones are collectively termed the opisthaptor. So I'll let you practice pronouncing those terms because I will ask you in class. There's a species in the genus uh, Gyrodactylus that can be serious pests in fish hatcheries, particularly since a single worm can give rise to more than 100 descendants in three weeks. So that's quite a problem if, these, if they get an infestation of them. Okay, our next class of parasitic flatworms are class Trematoda. There's about 8,000 parasitic species that are um, called flukes. They tend to be internal parasites, so they are endoparasitic. They do have complex life cycles, and they are specialized in parasitism in animal or human tissue. You will need to be familiar with their life cycle. In class, I will show you several videos about the different um, parasites, and they'll talk about their life cycles there as well. They do have one or more suckers around their anterior end, or they sometimes call it an oral sucker. It helps them attach to their parasite or to their host. This is a subclass in this particular class, the Digenians. Their life cycle involves two phases. They have several hosts and a number of developmental phases or stages. It includes two types of free living larvae, and this is the most complex life cycle in the animal world. Um, they have a definitive or a final host, and it's always a vertebrate. Snails are going to be the common intermediate host. All right, here we go with the life cycle. So this, this slide will give you a, a verbal description, and then the next slide will give you kind of a pictorial description. So first, eggs are shed, typically in the feces. They reach fresh water, and mericidium, their ciliated larva, will swim out. They will find a host, usually a snail, they will penetrate the snail and lose their cilia, and then they develop into something called a sporocyst, and the sporocyst has embryonic cells inside of it. Then they will develop into daughter sporocysts, where you will find hundreds of these little sporocysts in just one, from one of these myricidia. Hundreds of the next larval stage are produced, and they're called cercaria. These cercaria leave the snail and usually find another host. They can penetrate the host and become something called metacercaria. Then when the definitive host eats the second intermediate host, then it can grow into the adult parasitic worm. So here you can see the visual description. You can start with the cow passing feces and follow through step by step um, how a, a cow per se or an adult um, mammal or vertebrate can it, get sick with these types of flukes. So the species that infect humans can be divided into groups. There's schistosomes and non-schistosomes. Um, you can see there's different types of liver flukes, um, lung flukes, different types. Of, they'll go to different areas of the body and make you sick. Here's one. This is called Clonorchis sinesis. This is the Chinese liver fluke. 
It'll infect over 50 million people. It causes cirrhosis of the liver, diarrhea, edema, which is um, swelling in the tissue. You get a lot of fluid buildup. It definitely causes pain. Another diagram. And here's the location of its oral sucker so it can attach. There you can see it's an intestinal area. It does have a uterus, all that black stuff there, a yolk gland that helps produce nutrients, testes. There's their ovary, a seminal receptacle where they contain the sperm. Here's the general life cycle of the liver fluke for people. So the way that you would get it here is the metacercaria form cysts in fish. And then when the human eats the fish, the metacercaria hatch out into the adult fluke and find their way to the liver. Um, the eggs containing the myricidiums are shed in the human feces, and if it's not a clean area, these feces get into the fresh water, go into a snail, develop into cercaria, and then the cycle continues. Fasciola hepatica. This is the sheep liver fluke. Sheep, cattle, and man are the definitive hosts. You'll experience weight loss. Um, what happens is typically you'll have to eat the vegetation that have the metacercaria stuck to them. Life cycle of the sheep liver fluke, very similar. Again, um, their intermediate host will typically be a snail. Then we have Fasciolopsis abuski. Some of these are not easy to pronounce. This is an intestinal fluke. It'll infect about 10 million people. Man and pigs are the definitive host. Causes hemorrhage and abscess in your small intestine. Sounds like fun. The life cycle here. This is when um, you're told, you know, if you don't eat well-cooked pork and beef, this is how you can be infected, is if you're not eating or cooking your meat very well. Um, so it starts out, the eggs are passed in the host's feces. The eggs produce these myricidium. Myricidia infect the snail. Snail produce the cercaria. Cercaria are in the vegetation that get eaten by either pigs or man. And then if you eat those um, eggs, or the metacercaria, I should say, then these um, metacercaria will form cysts in your intestine. The adult hatches out, causes lots of problems. All right, Paragonimus westermanni. This is a lung fluke. Carnivores, pigs, rodents, man, these are all definitive hosts. It can be fatal. Here's our um, life cycle for these guys. It's It's got a couple different paths. Uh, let's start over on the left side where the eggs hatch and the meristidium find their way into the snail. This is our typical, obviously the snail is a very frequent, the poor little snails are intermediate hosts for a lot of things. Cercaria can come out of the snail and infect a second host. Typically it is a crustacean and they form cysts in the crustaceans. Then when you eat undercooked seafood, then you can get sick. So personally, I get concerned about um, when you're eating sushi. You know, if, if it's the wrong, if it's not processed well, then I, I personally stay away from sushi for this reason. Not telling you that you don't have to eat sushi, but just, you know, have that concern in the back of your mind. Um, but if it's undercooked or not treated properly, then these, then you'll be infected with these. Not all seafood carries it either. Um, but then the metacercaria form little cysts in the small intestine until they develop into the mature worm. The mature worm will then penetrate through your gut, get into your bloodstream, and find their way to your lung. And that's where the adult parasite lives. And then when you have these adult worms in your lungs, they're attached to you, feeding off of your 
blood basically to get their nutrients but they're shedding eggs and then you cough up the eggs and you don't actually cough them out they just kind of come up in the mucus and then you swallow them and that's how the eggs get into your feces and then the whole cycle continues from there these are, I don't know how old this data is. This is showing you the distribution of this particular lung fluke. More or less third world countries that don't have good sanitation. Schistosoma, this is another lovely parasite. These guys are blood flukes. This will um, infect over 200 million people. Uh, there's over a million deaths every year from them. These guys, um, you typically will not find them in the United States, but they will infect other countries. The, what the, obviously, the way that the worms can cause problems is they will block blood vessels. They, and if they block blood vessels in your organs, it'll cause irritation, bleeding, tissue decay, and they get a disease called schistosomiasis. There's some kind of gross pictures, I'll warn you here. Um, let's look at the life cycle first. So let's say someone has these, the eggs leave their body, um, actually in urine or feces because it's in their blood. The larva hatches, infects the poor little snail again. Larva can grow a tail and then they, um, the immature worms actually burrow through your skin and get into your blood vessels that way. And then the adult worm matures, reproduces in your blood vessels, the eggs travel to your intestines or bladder. So it sounds like fun, right? Um, this is what the little larva looks like. They have a forked tail. All right, class Cystoidea. These are tapeworms. They are most the most highly specialized class of flatworms. They are intestinal parasites. They do not have a digestive tract, therefore they reside in the digestive system of vertebrates and rely on vertebrates to give them their nutrients. They absorb nutrients across their body wall, usually through diffusion, and they can be anywhere from one millimeter to 25 meters long. Can you imagine having a tapeworm that is twice the length of my classroom growing inside of you? Yay. There's an image of a tapeworm. The, the fatter length of it looks like it's about 30 centimeters long. So 30, 60, 90, it's, you know, a, a good meter or so. Um, probably a little longer than a meter there in that picture. Here's what the head end of them looks like. Uh, it looks kind of like a harpoon, and that actually is what helps them stay attached in your digestive wall. So their body consists of an anterior scolex, so that spirally looking thing that you just saw is a scolex, and this solely works to attach to the gut. There is no mouth area here. Then they have a string of proglottids. Those are the, all the little segments that you see, and they possess both male and female reproductive organs. A close image of the scolex. Some of them have little side sucker discs to help them attach as well. They have something called tegument. This is a thickened protective layer on the outside of them that is made of cells, and it protects them from the host's digestive enzymes. I mean, you, you have these very strong enzymes that help break down food, and this tegument prevents your body from breaking them down, and it prevents your immune system from killing them. They also have a thick cuticle. This is a non-cellular protective coating found around the outside of them as well. So the little proglottids, those are the different segments along the tapeworm's body. They are hermaphroditic and they contain both male and female reproductive structures. Here's an enlarged image. You can actually see the little parts in here. And so they, these little proglottids contain fertilized eggs. 
these little segments will be shed in the feces. If you've ever seen things come out of your dog or cat in their, sometimes you'll see it around their little anus or it'll be in their feces, if it looks like rice, those are tapeworm segments. Those are actually one of these proglottids. That's what you are seeing. And if you see those, you need to take your pet to the vet so that they can have an anti-helminthic anti drug, which is um, a medication that kills the worms that are inside of them. Here's another diagram of the proglottid. So these little tapeworms can be up to 30 feet long, like we have said. Um, they can produce over 2,000 proglottids. They reproduce with these pieces and they add these new proglottids be right behind their scolex, that head area that's attached to the intestines. And then as they grow um, and they get bigger and they mature, the ones at the end will drop off and then be shed in the feces. And that's what I said, they look like rice. All right, let's start with the human shedding eggs in the feces. Um, and then let's say for whatever reason, these eggs are ingested by this pig. The eggs will hatch into larva and form cysts in the muscles of this pig. And if you think about it, when you're eating pork meat, you're eating muscle tissue. So these larvae have formed cysts in the muscle tissue. These cysts are very, um, hardy. They can survive in uh, this muscle tissue and if you don't cook your meat well enough you can ingest these cysts and then infect yourself. They do have regulations that where they inspect meat but they don't catch all of these so make sure you cook your food very well. Uh, beef tapeworm, similar situation, starting with the human, the percolatids are released in the feces. Somehow the cow's eating the grass that has these um, little eggs, and um, these eggs actually can survive for quite a while. Um, the cow eats it, the cysts form in their muscle tissue. If you don't cook your steak enough, you know, like if you like it really rare, be careful because there's a chance that you can eat meat that has these cysts. It's not a very prevalent thing, but it does happen. Here's a life cycle of the fish tapeworm. Again, let's start with the human eggs being shed in the feces. Somehow these eggs get in the water. These guys will infect an intermediate host, a type of crustacean, and then they go through their little development in the larva. Then a predator fish will eat, actually the crustacean gets eaten by small fish, the small fish get eaten by a bigger fish. Humans that eat undercooked fish get infected with this particular type of tapeworm. And then the Diplidium caninium, uh, this is the dog tapeworm. This is the one that, um, okay, we'll look at the life cycle again here. The eggs are shed in the feces. The um, eggs are ingested by fleas. And the, usually the larva of the flea are eating organic material. So they'll eat fecal material. And if the eggs are in there, they'll get that in their bodies. Then the larva develops into um, an adult flea. These fleas live on your dog and sometimes, I don't know if you see your dogs like chewing at themselves because they're itchy from these fleas. Well, if they eat the flea that has the um, tapeworm eggs inside or the tapeworm larva, that's how they can infect themselves again. So if you happen to see little rice segments, you need to not only deworm your dog, but check them for fleas too, because that's typically how they've gotten this tapeworm. All right, Echinococcus granulosus. This is also a parasite of dogs. Um, typically the dog is the host. You'll find juveniles of this type of worm in sheep and man. And I think this is one of the ones that has some really gross pictures. So I'm going to warn you ahead of time. Um, man and sheep are considered the intermediate host. They cause problems when they get into humans. Uh, they form something called a hydatid cyst. Um, and I'll show you shortly a picture, but here's their life cycle. Um, let's start with 
the top left, eggs are passed in the host species. The eggs are ingested by an intermediate host, sheep for example. Larva will hatch from the egg in the small intestine, penetrate the intestinal lining and enter the bloodstream. Um, so if you're eating this kind of meat, uh, the larva can be distributed to almost any organ. Sometimes the liver is usually the most common. However, if these hydatid cysts get into your other organs, like your brain, for example, you're going to see some serious problems. Um, the larva can develop into hydatid cysts. The definitive host, which is a dog or a canine, they get infected when they eat whatever meat that has these hydatid cysts in them. So it's not always humans, but um, it could be the, you know, a sheep sort of animal. Like if a wolf comes along and tries to eat some sheep that are in a flock, um, they can get in sick from the worm this way. Yes, here are the gross pictures. Hydatid cyst um, in a brain. And obviously this person's not alive because this cyst um, destroys brain tissue. This is called cystocircus. Um, this is the juvenile stage of them. Okay, I'm done grossing you out. Um, You're going to take the quiz now on platyhelminthes and uh, hopefully you remember everything from this um, video. If you need to, I'd strongly encourage you to go back and watch the video again. Like I said, there's going to be um, actual videos and some other instruction on these guys in class. So you'll get some more information from class well, as well.